Welcome back to 65 Drums. My name is Justin Greenwald, and this is the history of electronic drums. One, two, three. Ooh. What you are about to see is truly amazing. This product is not only a breakthrough in electronic drums, but will literally change the world of drums and percussion as we know it. Okay, so here's the thing. A lot of important advancements happened in the 90s, but wow, this decade had a rough start. The entire industry had just fallen apart in the late 80s. Simmons itself was struggling to the bitter end just to survive. And that wave of Simmons clones, well, they all left the industry or died off themselves. Electronic drums had finally lost their fad status. And before a new generation of drummers could be won over, electronic drum companies would have to find something new and interesting to bring to the table that we hadn't seen before. The 1990s would see a shift in power away from the UK in the United States towards Japan and Sweden, as juggernauts like Roland, D-Drum, and Yamaha began to control the market. In 1990, Axis Percussion released their Axis E-Pedal. They're now on to their third iteration, which costs about $150 as a pedal add-on. It mounts to the column, and there's a little pin that strikes the surface on each pedal depression. To my knowledge, this is the first drum trigger for a kick drum pedal of its type. In 1990, Roland released the SPD-8. This is a multipad like the Roland Octopad they had made before, but it came with built-in 16-bit sounds and sold for about 400 pounds. But the main sacrifice here was probably the loss of extra pad inputs. Meanwhile, Cat Inc. introduced the Cat KITI trigger interface. In 1990, a company called MIDI Drum made its NAM showcase. It's based out of France, and unfortunately, I don't really know that much about it. Yamaha released the DD11 Multipad. It was MIDI capable and featured PCM drum samples on board. It came with a free pair of drumsticks and listed for about 150 pounds. You probably forgot about the drum company Cheetah, didn't you? Though fast, they're fragile creatures built to sprint after small prey. Well, this year they released the P2M Converter. This was an 8-input MIDI trigger interface which sold for about $360. That was the list price. They also released the MD16RP module. The company only had another two years of life in it, as a recession hit the UK in 1993, causing the company to dissolve. A single cheetah is not strong enough to defend its prize. <laughs> In 1991, Yamaha released a DTS-70 MIDI trigger interface. It had 12 inputs, layering, crossfading, and also alternating modes. Even at the $945 list price, it was one of the better interfaces at the time. They also introduced the DT-10 trigger that year. And yeah, Emu is also still around in 91. They released the Maximum Percussion Module. Also around the same time frame, D-Drum released the Pad Station. In 1991, Cat released the Tomcat and the Kick Cat at NAMM. They listed for about $259. They also released the Midi Kitty Pro and the Drum Cat M. Man, those are some interesting names. In 1991, Simmons released the Trixer 2. It could be had for a $250 upgrade to your current unit. This came with upgraded sounds and programmability. All right, let's move ahead to a company not many people remember anymore, SNS Industries. Around 1991, they released the Stealth 7000 triggers, and the next year they released the ST7000. They also came out with a very sensitive 10 inches across Stinger PT1 dual zone pad and these were sold as a squadron drum set. In 1991, one of the first MIDI Sims drum sets was shown at the 1991 NAMM convention. There were symbols that were circular and chokeable with a bell zone. And finally, one last company for 1991, Sapphire Percussions. Designed by Steve Rothmill in Massachusetts, this company produced the Sapphire Slimline Designer Studio drum pads. These pads were made from a 6061 series aluminum and a gum rubber playing surface on top. They came in 6, 8, 10, and 12 inch variants. There was also a bunch of different colors. And according to one review at the time, the signal that these pads sent to the drum module was incredibly hot, so very, very sensitive when it goes over to the drum module. In 1992, D-Drum released a whole new set of drum triggers. They've essentially been selling this exact same drum trigger in a couple of different ways for about 30 years now. It's literally everywhere on a ton of famous drum sets. It might be one of their most successful electronic drum products of all time. The Lesis released the D4 module. It listed for about $400 and came with 400 sounds. This was the precursor to the very popular D5 module. In 1992, Simmons decided to go with acoustic heads for the first time since the SDS-3 and SDS-4 days. I actually went out and bought one of these pads myself. And something interesting about this drum set is that the kick drum has two triggers as well. The construction was drum head, foam, and then a circular metal sheet, and then a trigger underneath that, and then finally another layer of foam. So pretty standard for the time. And Simmons also introduced the Hexabug this year. In 1992, Cat released the Fat Cat and the Hat Cat pedals, as well as the Drum Cat 3.0 and the Drum Cat EZ. In 1992, Mini Sims made another NAM showing with new drum pads, including a three sensor snare with two separate rim zones. These were about 12 inches across. 
The kick drum was five and a half inches across. In 1992, Yamaha released the RM50 sound module, which featured a huge sound library of 1,100 16-bit sounds. So 92 was a very important year for Roland. They had tried making drum sets with the Alpha line a few years back. But to be honest, I don't think it sold to the degree that Roland wanted it to. So Roland developed an all-new drum set. It was a very basic configuration. You had PD7 pads, PD9 pads, an FD7 hi-hat controller, and then finally the KD7 kick drum pad. All this paired with the TD7 module. The drum set was called the TDE7K. This drum set set the template for what many electronic drum sets of the 90s would look like. The list price was about $2,640. If you remember Steve Fisher from old YouTube product demos, he was actually working on the Roland TD7 kit patches for that module. Now as a quick side note, there's a YouTube channel called Tech Tangents, who connected a computer to his TD7 and now we can see what it would sound like if you triggered Doom through a TD7. Alright, let's talk about Boom Theory. 1992 was their first advertisement of their new Space Muffins drum set in Modern Drummer magazine. While D-Drum and Heart Dynamics and many others were making electronic drums with acoustic heads and metal rims, Boom Theory was the first to make electronic drums with acoustic half shells. The snare and toms were 5.5 by 12 inches, and the kick drum was 10 by 22. In this first version, the rim zone actually had its own output on the snare. The shells were maple as of a 1992 review. Apparently, the foam dampening system under the drum head made for a satisfyingly realistic feel and plenty of give the harder you played. This drum set wasn't really a plug in and play system at first you really had to work the settings to get an accurate response from the pads. But when you got the settings right, apparently it worked fairly well. The list price in 1992 was about $1,400. You had to provide the symbols and the drum module. Sherpa is one of those electronic drum companies that time forgot. According to their website, which no longer exists, the company had been making the most comfortable drum pads on the planet since 1988. The Sherpa SP63 drum set featured 11-inch soft rubber pads for the snare and toms, a 9-inch kick drum, and three cymbals of unknown size. The drum set was surprisingly expensive for what it was. The rubber pads by themselves cost $1,376, and then if you wanted a drum rack on top of that, that would be another $700. And then you'd also have to buy a drum module separately because Sherpa did not manufacture any of their own. Sherpa drums were initially mentioned in the May 1992 issue of Modern Drummer magazine, and then reviewed in 1993. In the article, the review mentioned that there were three dealers, the drums were popular, and they'd been on the market for about a year and a half at that point. So we have a couple of conflicting dates here. Modern Dribber Magazine leads us to believe that the company started in 1992 or 1991, while the company itself says they've been around since 1988. In 1995, they came out with a new hi-hat and ride cymbal, and that was the last drum pad upgrade they would ever make. By the 2000s, the drum set was being paired with an Alesis DM5 on the official website, selling for about $2,000 Canadian. Or you could just buy the pads by themselves for $800 so the price had gone down significantly since the 90s. Something surprising that I learned while researching this was that Sherpa Drums had a rewards program, kind of like a vitamin company or something. Every time you convinced a friend to buy one of their drum sets, Sherpa Drums would literally pay you 50 bucks. So essentially, if you could find 40 people to buy a drum set from you, you'd have enough money to buy one yourself for free. The Internet Archive's Wayback Machine shows that the website was around until maybe 2009, before disappearing from the internet altogether. In 1993, Sapphire Percussion introduced a kick drum pad with a sponge-like rubber surface on it. It listed for about $340. 1993, Boom Theory. They released a World Stage Series drum set line. They ditched the half shells of the older version and went with full-sized, acoustic-looking electronic drums. The drum set featured a 12 by 22 kick drum and a 15 by 15 floor tom. The drum set also worked to address the problem of false triggering from loud stage volume. This was a problem with the earlier versions of the kit. From what I can tell, Boom Theory is the first proven electronic drum company to make full-sized electronic drums like this. Most wouldn't follow their footsteps until the mid-2000s. There were a few other guys that were maybe experimenting with large electronic drums in the 90s, but no one really had a full-blown company doing what Boom Theory was doing until a little bit later on. By 1995, the company had produced about 650 drum sets. They also produced the Space Muffin 0.0, .0 trigger interface, a pretty impressive unit for the day. Several patents were filed by the company in 1998 and 1999 for their trigger designs. And more importantly for this video, I feel like I should mention that this company has not faded away like many electronic drum companies from the 80s and 90s. It still exists, and if you go on their company Facebook page, you'll see that the owner is very active there showing himself making different drum sets and talking about different aspects of electronic drums.
All right, let's talk about Medelli. In 1993, Medelli built its very first factory. They would build another one in 2003, and then finally a huge complex in 2009 called Medelli Park. There is no denying that Medelli is one of the more important electronic drum companies by sheer volume of drum sets produced. This massive manufacturer makes electronic drums under their own brand names like Medelli and Yodrum, but they're better known for some of their other electronic drums they've made for this big list of companies. The design center for Medelli is based in Shanghai, and they export about 90% of the gear that they produce. And by the way, they also make keyboards, guitar pedals, speakers, and China Daily claims they made about $74 million in 2017, and spent about $4.5 million just on research and development. And because of the fact that this company is primarily known as being the invisible company that makes all the different drums for a lot of other brands, I will, for the most part, end coverage of the company here. Not every single inexpensive electronic drum set from the early 2000s is made by Medelli. There's actually quite a few other Chinese factories making stuff today, more than I thought there were, but I'll have to make a separate video about that. All right, let's talk about Zendrum. They were founded in 1993, and in 1994, they showed off their 24 trigger percussion device. To me at least, Zendrum is the only electronic drum company that has pulled off a handheld percussion controller of this type. In 1993, Roland released the SPD-11 total percussion pad. This had a list price of about $895. Let's talk about EPS. This is the first year they released the Visualite symbols as reviewed by Modern Drummer Magazine in March of 1993. These were quarter inch plastic symbols that came in 10, 12, 16, and 18 variants. The symbols came with what they called stick saver edges, rounded as to not destroy your drumsticks. Unlike other symbols of the time, they would flex on impact and came in really bright see-through colors. These were the first two-piece electronic hi-hats of the 90s. The Pearl Fightman did it once briefly in the 80s, but it didn't really stick. Unfortunately, with most modules, the open and closed action would only be open and closed. It wouldn't be a continuous, gradual shift. These symbols listed for about $116 through $225, depending on the symbol. They also released some retro-looking triangle pads that year at NAMM. In 1993, Yamaha released the TMX module and redesigned pads. The module came with 12 inputs and 245 sounds, at a list price of about $2,710. This made it more expensive than Roland's TDE 7K drum set, but they did offer a smaller configuration, the TMS-4, which listed for about $1,495. I thought that Artom was a brand new company when I saw the re-release of the Artom black hole mesh pads in the 2010s. But no, apparently they were a thing back in the 90s. In 1993, Tom Rogers showed off the E-pad, which featured a magnetic trigger base system at NAMM and later the black hole mesh would be shown off in 1999. Somewhere around 1993, K&K Pickup Systems released a ton of triggers. They released the Kick Guard, the Kick Star, the Trig Master Unit, the Hot Symbol, the Hot Hi-Hat, the Trig Star, the Trig Star Pro, the Rim Spot, and the Trig Guard System. If you wanted a kick drum trigger, K&K Pickup Systems had you covered. In 1993, Cat released a bunch of new stuff this year, and a few updates. There was the Cat DK10, which listed for about 500 bucks. There was the Polecat Trigger Bar. There was the Mini Kick for about 170, and the Drum Cat EZ 2.0. This same year saw the release of the D Drum AT. This was an 8 input, 16 bit drum module. It worked with D Drum's old sound pack cartridges from the D Drum 2 module, and it came with 64 samples built in. The system would work with many pads, but in the marketing, D Drum pushed the new red triggers that they had released the year before. So, in a way, this could be seen as a hybrid add on system to acoustic drums. They also sold it as a drum set package with regular D drum pads from earlier generations. Because of the module, this was an expensive system at the time. It was more in flagship territory compared to competitors like the Roland TDE 7K. To me, D drum owned the high end electronic drum market for the first half of the 90s. The complete drum set list price was $6,650, and the module trigger combo listed for about $5,350. In 1993, MIDI Sims came out with the CP16 trigger interface, as reviewed in the July issue of Modern Drummer magazine. List price was about $475. In 1993, Simmons came out with the Mini Hex slash Multi Hex pads, the Simmons Turtle Trap Multi Pad, the Stereo Hexabug Trigger, and the Simmons Multi Mallet. So now that we've reached 1994, I should probably catch you up on what the heck was happening with Simmons on the business side of things. Starting in 1987 onward, everything for the company had been going downhill. Simmons Electronics Limited was the original version of the company. It lasted from 1982 through 1987 
when it was sold to a venture capital firm called Carlton Communications. They had run into money problems. People just weren't buying as many electronic drum sets anymore, and the development of the SDX was incredibly expensive. Moving ahead to 1988, Dave Simmons created a new company called Tailhurst Electronics Limited. This was then renamed to Simmons Digital Music Limited. That's where this new plain logo came from. This new Simmons Digital was separate from Simmons Electronics, which had been sold to that Carlton Communications company. But not for long, because Dave Simmons bought all the drum sets and all the intellectual property from the venture capital firm that he had sold the old version of Simmons to, Simmons Electronics Limited. But unfortunately, Simmons Digital Limited also had problems of its own and died off in 1989, so it lasted around a year. But not to worry, because Dave Simmons had created yet another company called Sound Unit in 1988, which took up the electronic drums mantle as Simmons Digital died off. These were tough times for the company. Money was so tight that by 1993, Simmons was manufacturing drums from a retrofitted barn in his yard. Some of the last products they offered were the Hexaheads and the X-Rack. The Hexaheads drum set was basically the same pads from 1992 with acoustic heads, but now with tiny hexagon cymbal pads, and to my knowledge, no module included. That second product, the X-Rack, was a modified version of the Simmons SDX module. And by 1994, Sound Unit had stopped manufacturing electronic drums. Simmons Electronics USA and Simmons Electronics GmbH, the global distribution arm, died off in 1991. There was also a spin-off company not run by Dave Simmons called Simmons Services. This was run by a drum technician in the United States called Dennis. That's where the Simmons Streamline pads came from. Again, this product was not developed by Dave Simmons over at Sound Unit. This was just a spin-off company that died off in 1998. So Simmons as we knew it kind of ended in 1994 with the end of Sound Unit ending production of their electronic drums. The company is still kind of sort of around. There's a licensing deal with Guitar Center now. We'll talk more about the Guitar Center relationship in the 2000s section of the documentary. The story of Simmons is very complicated. I've done my best to simplify it for the sake of this video series, but if you'd like to learn more information, I highly recommend these two books. The first is The Complete Simmons Drum Book by Bob Hernett. This is written at the height of Simmons' popularity, and because of that, it's written in a very joyous, very hopeful way, right before it all fell apart in the 90s. It's a fun read, and I like Bob Hernett's writing style, but of course, it only covers to just before the SDX came out. The only real weakness of the book is the fact that it's so expensive. It's a collector's item. It's selling for around $150 through $180 on Amazon right now. It's no longer in print. I found a beat-up used one on eBay for $60 and I had it repaired. But for most people, it's not really worth buying. The second book is The Complete Simmons Drum Guide, The Rise and Fall of Simmons Electronic Drums by Alex Graham. This was incredibly helpful throughout the making of this series because Simmons is a big part of electronic drum history. It's a very, very detailed book and will give you every scrap of information you didn't know you wanted regarding the Simmons brand and all the different variations of the Simmons companies. I'll leave links to both of these books down in the description below. 1994 saw the release of the Mystique Sound Solution Triggers, the J2000, 1000, and 5000. In 1994, Trigger Perfect released The Bone. This is a pad that you could mount on top of a hi-hat. They also released an updated Trigger, the 2010 AP. In 94, D-Drum released the Remote Control 1, otherwise known as the RC1. This was similar to something that Simmons had done years before. It let you change kits with a tap of your drumstick. But more importantly, they released the D-Drum 3 system. This drum set came with single zone 10 inch toms and featured coated Remo Ambassador heads. The snare was a dual zone 12 inch pad and the kick drum was a tower design. The real star of the show, of course, was with the module, not the pads. The D-Drum 3 module came with 100 factory kit slots, 10 trigger inputs, and 8 outputs. There was an SCSI port to interface with a Mac computer or an Akai sampler. That way you could have even more sounds. There was also a host of different editing features on board that added up to make for a very capable drum module. The drum pads listed for $1,950 and the drum module listed for $4,850. So this drum set again was not cheap. I'm kind of wondering how they got away with all this pricing in the 90s when electronic drums were in the middle of their decline. <laughs> In 1994, K&K Pickup Systems released the Padman pads. Apparently, the Roland TDE-7K was a popular drum set, so they decided to make a lower-priced version. In 1994, Roland released the TD-5 module and the KD-5 kick trigger. The module had 8 inputs and 210 sounds. The new kick pad was a modified version of the KD-7 horizontal kick trigger, but with output controls, minus polarity switch, and carpet spikes. The whole drum set was sold as the TDE-5K and also later the TD-5K. List prices kind of range here. I've seen it for $2,045 and $1,795. 
probably depending on the year that you look at it. Also check out the other Roland drum systems that include the new trap set featuring the TD-5 percussion sound module and stage set featuring the new TD-7 T turbo sound module. Roland drum systems. The future of drumming has arrived. In 1994, Hart Dynamics would release an electronic drum set with metal cymbals. This would set the template for the type of electronic drums they would make throughout the rest of their lifespan. In 1994, Korg released the original Wave Drum. This was the WD-1 edition, but this thing absolutely rocked. It had an acoustic Remo head on top of it, and it was one of the first pads to use DSP modeling instead of samples. It came with 100 patches, and Korg released the RE-1 to help you edit them. This thing was incredibly powerful and fun to play. I also like the fact that you could tension the drum head however you wanted, or just switch it out to a different kind of drum head. In the original production batch, they only made about seven or 800 of these. That's probably because the original ones sold for a whopping $3,000 each. They are awesome, but they were so expensive that not everybody could buy them. This pad still does have a small cult following of fans to this day though. 1994 also saw a few updates coming from EPS. This year they released possibly the first ever electronic cowbell, the Visualite electronic cowbell. They also released the quiet drum triggering system this year. They also came out with something called the shaker and something called the wing ding. <sighs> Find a better name guys. 1994 was a pretty quiet year for Cat Inc. They didn't come out with much, but they did release the KDT 200 rim mounted trigger. 94 also saw the release of the Concept One trigger pad. This was a triggered rubber pad that you'd put on top of your acoustic drum head, similar in concept to N Fused a few years later. This was sold in a wide range of sizes, going from eight inches across to 18 inches across. There were also cymbal variants as well. They also released something called the six pack multi-pad. Each zone was about four inches across. I'm guessing a lot of people haven't heard of Concept One, but apparently it was decently successful because they advertised these products in magazines for years. Moving ahead to 1995, SNS Industries released the Sidewinder Hi-Hats and Spitfire DX trigger interface. D-Drum released a new vintage drum sounds library for the D-Drum 3. Most of these sounds were taken from the D-Drum 2 module, the D-Drum AT module, and the Soundpack cartridge library. This whole upgrade sold for about $185. The catch? The sounds actually came on 13 individual floppy disks. 1995 was a pretty slow year for Yamaha. All they really added was some plastic cymbals to the TMX drum set, a solid upgrade. EPS showed off a three zone multi-pad at NAMM, the Visualite 3 pad. At this time, they were still an independent company not yet owned by Pintech. In 1995, Concept One showed off the Adapad. This is similar in concept to the Simmons drum huggers and sold for a relatively cheap $99 list price. Unfortunately, in 1995, Cat Inc. went out of business, and Bill Kotowski left the company. Mario bought the assets to Cat Inc. around November of that year, and he created a new company called Alternate Mode a few months later in January of 1996. So originally, the plan was just to be a repair shop for Cat products that were already out there being used by professional musicians. But it slowly morphed into a full-blown new version of Cat Inc. So you could say Cat Inc. was reborn as Alternate Mode in 1996, a continuation of the previous company. In 1996, a new company called Overdrum showed up. It's a very interesting looking kit with wooden casings. I've never really seen much about this company other than something in Modern Drummer Magazine back in the 90s, so unfortunately, I can only assume they eventually went out of business. 96 saw the release of new updated cymbals and drum pads from Heart Dynamics. And Elisa showed up to the 96 NAMM event with the new ATK integrated drum trigger system. It came with the DM5 module and seven dual zone pads with moon gel surfaces. The DM5 drum module sold like crazy for years and years and turned into one of the best selling drum modules of all time. Time. In 1996, Yamaha showed off the DTX electronic percussion system. The DTX brand naming scheme would be something that Yamaha would stick with for the next 20 years. The drum module had 32 note polyphony, 16 bit sounds, a 900 plus sound library, and a bunch of different effect options inside of the module. In 1996, Concept One was back at it again with something called the undercover trigger pads. The whole system had a few different layers. First, you'd install a plate that rested on the shell, and then a quarter inch layer of foam and then you put your regular acoustic head on top of that. Even though you were playing an acoustic drum set, the system killed the acoustic tone and volume, and now you're playing an electronic drum set. The wires would plug in the bottom plates and then run out the air vent. The list price was about $139, I believe, for each piece. In 1996, Genesis came out with the Plus Portable Trigger System, a budget drum set that retailed for about $750, plus the module. It was designed to be compact and fold flat for storage or travel. In 1996, Leon showed off the Mark V series pad. This let you convert an acoustic drum set over to electronic, very similar to Concept One. In 1996, Pintec made its first NAM appearance with the NX6 multipad. Back in the mid-90s, Pintec was also known for their kick and hi-hat pedals. 
you'll hear a lot about Pentec throughout the 90s and early 2000s. Jumping ahead to 1997, Concept One Percussion introduced the XJ12 multipad, featuring 12 different zones. There was also the ProLine Plus, acoustic shells that came pre-installed with the undercover triggers. The list price was about $1,800, and the sizes were 8, 10, 12, 13, 16, and 22 inch shells. The main competition for this drum set at the moment was probably Space Muffins. In 1997, SNS Industries showed up with the introduction of the M6 Multipad. In 1997, Buchler released an electronic hand percussion controller to be sold by Emu with a $2,000 list price. The man behind this product was Don Buchla. He was a pioneer of musical electronics back in the day, and unfortunately, he passed away in 2016. I couldn't track down the exact percussion controller that was released in 1997 because it was just a text news blurb in Modern Drummer magazine with no photo. This is a good point in the series to cover a few of the different products that Don Buchla released over his career in the electronic drum segment. This is the Buchla Marimba Lumina. It appears to have come in two separate sizes, the larger curved gold edition and the more standard sized one just called the Buchla Marimba Lumina. This was an incredibly interesting range of products. The most interesting thing about this system was the fact that it wasn't using standard FSR or PA or switches. It was using a completely separate set of sensors from anything we've seen before or since. The best thing about it to me was the fact that one key could have four separate sounds depending on which mallet that you use to play on it. And here's how it all worked. This marimba lumina was designed by Don Buchla, an engineer from uh, Berkeley, California, who is a real pioneer in synthesizer design. Uh, worked with Bob Moog back in the 1960s. And these days he's building these unusual MIDI controllers, so that's one of them. Wires underneath here, and so in, inside each one of these keys is a coil. Inside the mallets also, there are coils. They emit a magnetic field. And when these mallets that are like antennas come enter the magnetic field, the instrument starts triggering. You can see that I don't actually even have to touch the instrument, and it already starts playing. There are four color-coded mallets that you see here. There's a red, yellow, green, and blue. Using radio frequency technology, I can then assign a different sound to every mallet if I want. So, that sound. You, know, you could say I could do that with zones, but you can't because you can't play the same key. with the same mallet and still get a different sound. In other words, if I change my mallets, I actually get a different chord because now the different sounds are attached to each. In addition to the products I've already covered, there was also the Buchla Thunder and Lightning. In December of 1997, D-Drum introduced the D-Drum 4 drum set. This was a nice improvement over the previous kit and the module side of things, and thankfully, it was way cheaper than the previous drum sets they've been selling, at about $3,000 retail for a five-piece kit. Until this year, at least in my opinion, D-Drum had not faced any real competition in the 90s as far as flagship modules go, but soon this would be going up against the Roland TD-10. While I think it's fair to say that the Roland TD-10 had a greater impact on electronic drums, I think the D-Drum 4 module aged a little bit more gracefully. This one is still pretty sought after. In 1997, Yamaha released the DTX2 drum set. I actually stumbled across one of these in a box at Sam Ash. So here's what the module looks like and the kick drum tower and like some of the cymbals. This wasn't like a huge leap forward from the previous DTX drum set. It was more of a minor upgrade. Tony V in the mix. Crunch into it. It's all in the mix. That same year, Drum Tech introduced a two zone rubber pad to complement their existing range of pads post Cat Inc. Okay, so now let's talk about Roland. 1997 marks possibly the most important year in their electronic drum history. This is the year that the Roland TD-10 drum set came out. By the way, this was the original version without the V symbols. That version of the TD-10 would appear in the 2000s. This product is not only a breakthrough in electronic drums, but will literally change the world of drums and percussion as we know it. 
It's electronic drums like you have never seen or heard before. Woo! That snare is good. This thing does everything that a drummer would want to do. That right there is just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You know. It's a whole different uh, concept, feel, and response to what you've seen before from electronic drums, definitely. It just feel real. I feel like I'm sitting behind a kid. Yeah. And it um, <clears throat> the snare tracks beautifully. Several key things made this drum set important. The first was that Roland brought Cosm modeling, initially made for the V guitar, over to their drum division. This was the first time that drummers had the ability to change virtual drum heads, virtual mic placements, virtual shell depth, change the rim size, and more with inside of a drum module. Even though the technology was still in its early stages and really didn't sound as good as a high quality sample, the sheer editing flexibility shocked a lot of drummers. Positional sensing was the second feature that made this drum set stand out. So dynamic it knows where on the drum you're playing. Now, of course, Roland was not the first company to do positional sensing inside of electronic drums. Simmons had already done that like a decade before them. But I believe Roland was the first to figure out how to do it with a piezo sensor. The third and most important innovation was the introduction of mesh heads in collaboration with Remo. It was basically two layers of a screen door mesh material inside of a drum hoop. But the fact is, Roland and Remo put it together in a complete drum set for the first time and then leaned into it with their marketing dollars. And I gotta tell you, the Roland patent on mesh heads was an important 3D chess move for the company. Now, no other company can make a low volume drum head for electronic drums without paying Roland a very expensive licensing fee. The Roland lawyer team had become a revenue source for the drum department and would continue to be for decades. But none of this takes away from the fact that the Roland TD-10 was one of the most important electronic drums in history. Once this drum set came out, the entire industry was on a course towards mesh heads. E-drums would never be the same. It's the new V-drums, and it's only from Roland. Want to see more? Well, buckle up and hang on. Start with the new PD-100 and PD-120 V-pads. Their unique fine mesh head and rubber counter hoop not only keep consistent feel with the industry standard PD-7 and PD-9 dual trigger pads, but keep the V-pads virtually noiseless. It's also nice to know that the PD-100 and PD-120 V-pads work with any of Roland's percussion sound sources, including the SPD-11, TD-5, TD-7 T, and TD-10. Incorporate the V-pads with the KD-7 kick trigger, FD-7 hi-hat controller, and the PD-7 and PD-9 pads for cymbals. Plug them all together into the new TD-10 percussion sound module, and you've got a powerhouse electronic drum system. That year, D-Drum came out with a much needed upgrade to their cymbal line. They had a brand new hi-hat on a stand, which was great, and then finally, a two-zone cymbal. Yet another company that I had no idea existed, SIB Drum Systems showed off the AD pads with steel shells. Unfortunately, other than a mention in Modern Drummer Magazine, I can't find out much information about their electronic drum history. 1998 saw the release of the Roland KD-120 V-Kick. They've been selling versions of that kick drum for about 20 years now. I think the original designer for that pad works at ATV now. They also released the SPD-20 Total Percussion Pad. It featured 700 sounds, 99 patches, effects, and a 14-note polyphony. They also made a rolling drum case. Protect your investment with the V-Drums Travel Case and Bag Set. Their custom foam cutouts for the components components, lockable latches, and pull-out handle with wheels makes transporting the V-Drums a breeze. Okay, so let's talk about V-Expressions. They were founded in 1998. V-Expressions is a company that creates custom kits for drum modules. Essentially, the owner of V-Expressions, Alan Miller, basically sweats over the module for weeks, tweaking the built-in sounds to create better sounding kits than the ones included from the factory. Now, of course, anyone can do this fairly easily, and a lot of people have done this, other than V-Expressions. But the reason why I'm mentioning V-Expressions specifically is the simple fact that he's been doing this for every module that's come out over the past 20 years. As long as the module has decent editing controls, you can only work with what you're given. The size of the back catalog is pretty impressive, and he started that in 1998. Drum Tech came out with a 10-inch kick drum pad for about $229 list price. Another obscure product that came out in the 90s was Guts. Apparently, they came out with a conversion drum head in 1998. It's a very obscure company, and if you try to Google it, all you're really going to find is a mention in Modern Drummer Magazine from the 90s and a punk rock band from 2002. Jumping ahead to 1999, Yamaha announced a DT Express. This was a very inexpensive drum set with good editing features and a large 900 sound selection. So I would say this was a decent competitor to the Roland TDE 5K. On the downside, the cymbals really weren't that great, and oddly, it only came with one zone pads. It was also mentioned in a review from the day 
that some of the sounds were kind of like digitally distorted for some reason, maybe because they were sampled in at too high of a volume. The drum set listed for $1,295, but it sold for $1,000. This year, Roland released the TD-8 module, the KD-80 kick drum, and the PD-80 pads. The Roland TD-8 module brought many of the different editing features the TD-10 had and actually had more sounds than the TD-10, 1,286 versus 700. This whole thing of including less sounds in the flagship drum module is something that Roland keeps doing. For example, the TD-27 module has more sounds than the TD-50. So the resulting drum set from the TD-8 module went under a bunch of different names. It was called the V Custom Set at NAMM, and then later the TD-8 KV, or the V Stage Set in a Roland VHS promo tape years later. It sold for about $2,700 at music stores in the United States. In 1999, Heart Dynamics created the custom X drum set with triangle cymbal pads called the E-Cymbal X. I have an uncle that actually owns this drum set, so I kind of sort of grew up playing this kit, and it was my main exposure to the Heart Dynamics brand name. Apparently at some point, that rubber covering on the plastic cymbals fell off or something. I really like this drum set. It was mesh, it was pretty large for the time, and I think it was a little bit cheaper than if you had bought one of the Roland ones. In 1999, Pintech released the CS8SE, the ZB3 Bell, the Contracast ST series, the Silent Tech Mesh Heads, and finally the Hyper Hat. Sorry, the Hyper Hat. I feel like Hyper Hat's a better name. Another company that would be related to Pintech pretty soon was EPS. This year they released a Visualite symbol redesign, including a China. To my knowledge, this is one of the first China looking electronic symbols. In 1999, Alternate Mode worked with Alesis to make a variant of the Mallet Cat with an Alesis sound engine inside. This was called the Mallet Cat Pro WS. That same year, Drum Tech came out with something called the Professional Trigger System and Elises came out with the DM Pro at NAMM. This oddly looks like a heart drum set, but with mesh heads. We've talked about all the individual drums, but now let's talk about the broad overall trends. The strange thing about covering this era is the fact that electronic drums were seemingly getting better and worse at the same time. What exactly do I mean by that? On the positive side, we saw some really nice trends. First, mesh heads completely changed the industry. Positional sensing via piezos versus FSR was also a positive development. Space muffins came out with full-sized acoustic electronic drums. We also saw conversion packages from a bunch of different companies. We also saw some two-piece hi-hats, which we only had seen once before with the Pearl Fightman. Drum modules themselves came with more powerful electronics and more space on board. So you could have more sounds and you could do more effects on those sounds themselves. So with all these positive trends happening in the electronic drum industry, how come the whole decade leaves a bad taste in people's mouths when it comes to electronic drums. When you take a second to think about it, the answer becomes fairly obvious. The sounds in most of these drum modules were kind of cheesy. The fact of the matter is, electronic drums were in a transitionary period in the 90s. The 80s were all about analog synth-based sounds, and the 90s were switching over to the more realistic sounds. But the problem is, electronic drum technology just wasn't quite there yet on the module side of things. We were smack dab in the middle of the uncanny valley. A good analogy for this is the video game industry. We saw the transition over from 2D graphics to 3D graphics. 3D graphics were definitely exciting and new, but they weren't as nice looking as 2D graphics for quite a while before the technology caught up. So when you sit down to play an electronic drum set from the 90s and wonder why it sounds a little bit cringy sometimes, that's because you're listening to a combination of technical limitations and the fact that it was designed for a drummer in a different decade than you. Let's be honest, the 1990s were very cheesy and cringy altogether, so it's not surprising that some of the electronic drums that came out from that decade were also that. But it's important nonetheless because of the innovations that happened near the tail end of that decade. That's it for this episode. The next one should be coming out fairly soon. Big shout out to the people on Patreon who helped make this possible. If you want to learn more about the history of electronic drums in written form, here are the books and magazines that I used as sources throughout making this series. As you can see, the documentary series has taken an enormous amount of work, so I appreciate you watching all the way to the end of the video. See you in a few.